The year is 1999. That sentence brings me back to my senior kindergarten class when I was five years old, where we had to read out the date on the blackboard every single day. The year 1999 exists as a stain in my mind, however, as a memory that will not go away no matter how I try to forget it. 1999 marks the year I lost my first tooth, my first time on a plane, and unfortunately, the loss of my childhood innocence. That one memory that refuses to be wiped. It all started with that new, or old TV at that time. Pokemon was the latest fad to hit the school. Pokemon cards, games, stickers and most popular, the TV show. So of course, every time I came home from school, I would stay glued to the TV until Pokemon came on at 5. The only problem was that my dad watched the news at 5.30 and Pokemon episodes were back to back, which meant I had to miss an episode every day, something I whined on and on about. My dad got tired of hearing me complain every day. That must have been why he went and bought another TV. My dad put the TV he bought in my room. Unfortunately, it was just an old boob tube with rabbit ears even. It also had about 20 channels available, not including the channel Pokemon was on. I recall I didn't care though. I was just thrilled I had my own TV in my room. After surfing through the channels, I came to the conclusion that only channel 2 TVO Kids was worth watching so I watched that for a while. It wasn't for another few months until I discovered Channel 21. One day in April, I was flipping through the channels trying to see if Pokemon was on. I pressed Channel 21 into the remote, hoping there were more channels, and to my delight there was. My dad was surprised too but he let me watch it because it seemed to have kids programs on. The channel was called Caledon Local. 21 and later, I found out it was indeed broadcasted from the town of Caledon, Ontario, a town very close to my city. The shows I saw on Caledon Local 21 looked poorly made, and I never understood what was going on half of the time. However, as I grew up, every time I thought of that channel, I realised more and more how messed up the shows were and I had to ask myself, what the hell was I watching? The following is a list of shows and episodes I remember seeing on Caledon Local 21. How I remember such detail even disturbs me. But I guess things like this stands out in your mind for a while. April 1999, Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 12. Very sketchy name if you were to look at it nowadays. The show featured a guy wearing a bear mascot costume who would get a new visitor to his cellar every day. It was always a kid. The show was filmed with a camcorder and, and not a very good one either. The police asked me a lot of questions about this show. This episode started with Mr. Bear sitting at the table playing checkers by himself. He sat there playing for a bit until there was a knock on the door. The camera was then looking up the stairs at the door, where there was another knock. Mr. Bear climbed the stairs and opened the door to reveal two young children. One was a boy about my age, and the other was a girl who looked about eight. Mr. Bear danced in delight, and then started talking to the kids. I remember I couldn't hear any of them very well though. Mr. Bear then led the kids into the cellar, which was quite dark, only lit by a small oil lamp on the table. I can't really remember that much more, except him singing a song which I couldn't hear too well either, probably because of that large bear mask. The episode ended with them playing hide and seek, with the kids hiding in the closet and Mr. Bear counting. May 1999, Soup and Spoon. I don't think this was even a show, I think it was more of a special movie thing. All I know is I stopped watching Caledon Local 21 for a while because 
I thought this show was too stupid, especially since Pokemon now came on at 4.30 and 5. I don't remember much of this, but it showed a can of soup and a spoon both attached to strings, swinging back and forth as if someone was holding them and dangling them in front of a camera. Interestingly enough, the show was shot in a basement which looked just like the one used in Mr. Bear's cellar. Like I said, I can't remember much, the only thing I can remember clearly was the end. The entire thing was only half an hour, and just included stuff I found stupid, such as the spoon chasing the soup around, trying to eat him, and about seven kids sitting around it, each with a bowl of soup in front of him. They were sitting and looking at the camera, but with confused, almost frightened faces. The cameraman then held the can of soup in front of the kids and said, Spoons ready. And then it just stopped. July 1999. It was summer and I hadn't watched Channel 21 for a while. Until one day when I slipped over at my friend's house, I decided to check it out again. My friend had gotten a TV in his room for his 6th birthday, so he stayed up very late, for us 9.30 was very late, and watched TV. That's when I remembered Channel 21 and brought it up to my friend. We decided to see if it was on and, to our surprise, it was. They must have changed their broadcasting time. Mr. Bear's Cellar Episode 23 this episode was entertaining for my friend and I, mainly because it had swearing. However, now, when I think of this episode, I realised something was definitely wrong when it was filmed. The episode started with the camera on its side, while it was facing Mr. Bear, who was walking up the stairs to the cellar door. The camera then blacked out for about a second, before fading in, back upright, and facing Mr. Bear. There was also another kid talking to him. This kid looked about 11 or 12. He was talking to Mr. Bear for a while, but I couldn't hear well, again with a crappy camcorder, until the kid started raising his voice. The kid was saying how it was late and his sister had to go home. You could hear more voices in the background. I remember Mr. Bear clearly saying, Get the hell out, you're not invited, with a deep voice muffled by the bear mask. I remember my friend and I looking at each other and laughing at him raising his voice, but the episode got weirder. The kid began climbing the stairs before turning around and saying how he was going to call the police. Mr. Bear began breaking into a run towards the kid who started screaming and running as well. The camera then cut out, and that was the end of the episode. The channel then turned to static shortly after. August 1999 In August, I grew more curious to see Mr. Bear's cellar for some reason though. The last episode I saw of Mr. Bear was weird, which also made me think the show was meant for teenagers. Nonetheless, I flipped onto channel 21 when my dad was busy. Mr. Bear's Cellar, episode 28. Apparently this episode had been playing the entire month of August. This episode was studied a lot by the police. The entire episode was just Mr. Bear sitting in a chair, talking to the audience. Hello kids, do you want to visit my cellar? If you do, please write me a letter at this address. The screen then switched to a white screen with multicolored letters reading the address, and that was what remained for the rest of the episode. And guess what? I actually did. I sent Mr. Bear, or that sick asshole who portrayed him, a letter. I did it out of curiosity, mostly. My dad was okay with it because... He thought it was a legit kids show, but then again, he never saw any of what was on Channel 21. So my dad sent the letter to the address Mr. Bear said on the show. It stayed on all day anyway for some reason. 
It took about a week to get a response, which I was surprised I did. I still have the letter I received. August 15th, 1999. The letter read, Dear Elliot, thank you ever so much for your letter. I would love to have you in my cellar. We play games, watch movies and go fire camping in the middle of the woods. Come to my house at... The police cut out this address. Caledon, Ontario, Canada. I look very forward to having fun with you. Love, Mr. Bear. I cannot believe my dad never found this sketchy because he actually took me to the house. And that's when the police became involved. Those endless questions. Those pictures of terrified kids in the woods. That brings me to why I'm writing this blog. That psycho and his friends did some messed up stuff back then. And now it seems he's trying to get into contact with me again. The entire police thing is coming back. That has brought 1999 back to me. Over a decade later, it is still happening. Update. People have been emailing me asking what exactly happened in 1999. I'll get to that. Those weird TV shows I was watching apparently were meant to attract kids to Mr. Bear's house. What Mr. Bear did shocked the entire town. My dad actually drove me to Caledon, along with the address Mr. Bear left on the letter. The house was actually in the outskirts of the town, in the open farmland. I still remember that house. It looked like an older farmhouse that looked to have been built in the early 1900s. The windows were all boarded up and the house looked in a state of disrepair. As we walked up to the house, I remember my dad checking the address over and over again and looking at the house in disbelief. Then, the door opened. I expected to see Mr. Bear to be at the door, but I was surprised to see a police officer emerge from the creaking door. The officer began talking to my dad while I quickly asked if that was Mr. Bear's house. The officer's face cringed slightly and muttered, Oh God, or something like that. He started talking quietly to my dad, so I couldn't hear. Although my dad told me to go to the car anyway. And then we just went home. My dad was quiet the whole way home. I felt something strange had happened. My dad never told me what happened for a while. I forgot about it anyway too. Channel 21 no longer came on. And when I asked about it, my dad would not acknowledge its existence. I think... It was when I was 13 where I learnt the truth. I remembered Channel 21 one day and asked my dad about it. I guess he finally decided I could hear the truth. Caledon Local 21 was a local TV channel that ran from October 1997 to August 1999 in the Peel region of Ontario. The entire channel was made from a house in Caledon the one I visited, and run by a man who was, and was run by a man who was not really known by anyone in the town. The channel was only available to older TVs because the signal was one only picked up by rabbit ears, weaker frequency. The man created all the shows on the channel, all of which were kid shows. He was Mr. Bear, and he was the mysterious cameraman. The real reason he created the channel was more disturbing than what I originally thought. As you might have already guessed, he kidnapped kids and held them in his cellar. But while most people thought he was a serial child molester, he really wanted to use kids for another purpose. The day I arrived, the man had fled his house the night before, the day before the police went in for their investigation. I wasn't the only one who was watching. Update. Sorry for not answering any questions for so long. I haven't accessed my email account for some time. Anyway, 
let me finally set things straight about what I know. Back in October, I visited the house previously owned by the man who ran Caledon Local 21. Two women lived there, operating a daycare business. How ironic. Now, to answer the questions you guys emailed to me, question, who else watched Caledon Local 21? I know other people watched it for sure, including those kids who wound up at Mr. Bear's house. After some Google searches, I found a few people on Neoseeker forums who were discussing the shows from Caledon Local 21. They talked about the kids' shows I watched, but also two other shows I had never seen before. A user named I Am Real Life seemed to know all the shows that were broadcasted on Channel 21. Here are two I've never heard of. The Fallen Angel and Life I Am Real Life described it as fairly boring show about a guy rambling on and on in front of the camera about how we must please Satan and appease him before it's too late. Paint with the soul. I Am Real Life and another guy called Siggy92 were discussing this show. They described it as Blair Witch-like, as it consisted of a cameraman wandering around a forest at night, doing nothing particularly interesting. I'll go looking for the conversation and see if I can get the link. Question. Where is Mr. Bear, or the guy who wore the costume? If I did know, I would have said earlier. I have no idea where this guy is, if he's dead or alive, hopefully dead. When I see my dad's friend next, I'll tell him about this. Maybe I can get a more definite answer. Question. What did Mr. Bear do to the children? This is by far the most common question I've been asked. I found this out in October as well, via my dad's friend, who is a retired Caledon regional officer. Apparently, the man playing Mr. Bear took the kids out of the house and into the forest nearby. What he did there, police are not exactly sure how it happened, but 16 charred bodies of children between the ages of 4 and 13 were found in a 15 by 15 foot ditch deep within the forest. My dad's friend did not want to go into exact details, but I'm seeing him next Thursday anyway, so maybe I can exhort more information from him then. That's all I have for now. Thanks for keeping an interest in my blog. I will try to gather as much information as I can for my next post. I've actually been getting pretty interested in this myself. It should be my right to know what the hell happened. Update. I'm sorry I haven't posted anything for a while. I kind of lost interest in this blog since I hit a standstill while looking for more information about the identity of the owner of Caledon Local 21. However, a few weeks ago, I struck gold. I found some answers, surprisingly, from the father of a kid I used to babysit. He lives just across from my street, and I used to look after his kids when they were younger. He currently doesn't have a job either. He used to live near the woods outside Caledon and witnessed the owner's activities in the woods. His name is Anthony Polo. When he lived in the small bungalow outside the woods, he would often venture in to smoke a joint or two before returning to his work as a wood craftsman. Polo described that Sometimes, he would hear voices of children coming from deeper within the woods, as well as glowing lights off in the distance. Polo told me that these events started in late 1997. Note, this is around the time Caledon Local 21 began airing. He apparently became annoyed by this happening every once in a while, and actually went to investigate. Polo then described what the whole scene looked like when he got there. There was a group of kids, he said, about 13 to 17, and ages 5 to 12, gathering around a large fire pit with a burning fire. With them was a single adult. Polo talked to the man. Nothing is unusual, unkempt appearance of a crack addict as well as his constant twitching, and asked what he was doing out in the forest with the children. 
The man said they were on a camping trip, something they did frequently. Polo, not suspecting anything, Caladon has one of the lowest crime rates in Canada, simply left it at that and told them to be quieter. Polo then paused for a while before telling me that they never became quieter. In fact, sometimes he heard loud chanting from the children in an unknown language. He didn't bother meeting with the man again, as he was moving anyway. I told Polo that the man was probably the owner of Caledon Local 21, but he doubted it, as he heard that the man was moving to Pickering by several other residents near the area. Here is what I know now. The man would take kids into the woods regularly for camping. The fire pit Polo described may be the hole the bodies of the children were found in. The children Polo saw were probably the ones found dead. The man moved into a city called Pickering, a smaller city east of Toronto. I will discuss this with my dad's friend, the ex-cop, and see if this matches anything the police knew about the man. I also want to see if he has any other knowledge of what was aired on Caledon Local 21. Update Good news guys, I talked to my dad's friend and he disclosed a lot of information for me. First, I asked if the police had any information on the man who ran Caledon Local 21. He replied that they only have the same leads for years and never found a suspect. However, the Peel Regional Police do have some of the tapes found in the house Caledon Local 21 was broadcasted from. He took me over so I could watch a few. I guess I haven't said much about him yet. My dad's friend name is Mitchell Wilson, a pretty nice guy. He seems to understand my thirst for knowledge on what happened during the late 90s in that house. He feels it was wrong that my dad went so long without telling me much. He took me to the Davis Road Police Station. If you don't know, it's the largest station in Caledon and one of the largest within the Peel region itself. Each of the main stations around Peel have some of the tapes. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to take any home for obvious reasons. Paint with the Soul, Episode 10, Garbage Thrown Away. Paint with the Soul was one of the shows that I Am Real and Siggy92 discussed on Neo Seeker. I told the police about this and they informed me that 12 episodes of the show were made and broadcasted between December 5th, 1997 and January 8th, 1998. Exactly as I Am Real Life and Siggy92 described, the episode opened with the cameraman wandering around in a forest. It appeared to be during the evening as it seemed the sun was setting. The cameraman walked along the path until he got to an area where there was a lot of garbage laying in the leaves. The camera looked around at the various wrappers, bottles, bags and boxes, making sure each item got a few seconds of screen time. The camera then focused into a single area before the man spoke. I recall he spoke in a very timid, quiet voice, and I swear I've heard it somewhere else before, like on another Caledon Local 21 show. I could barely hear what he was saying, but he mainly talked about how humans are garbage or something that had to do with saving ourselves by cleaning up the garbage, us. It actually sounded really stupid, but still, a feeling of dread came over me. I mean, the forest was probably where those bodies were found, right? Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 25 When the police administrator brought this tape in, I actually said, Oh snap, and chuckled a bit out loud. Of course, I got stares from the staff, but Wilson explained to them about my little experience with Mr. Bear and how I still kept the letter he sent me. Like the previous episodes, this one included a guy wearing a bear mascot costume. Following him were 16 children. Some looked as young as four, others looked like they were practically teenagers. As the children entered, the administrator commented that 
This is the only episode that showed all 16 victims. The kids all looked rather content, except for this one who had visible bruises on his face. And unlike the other kids, he had a more fearful expression. He also looked about 11 or 12, which caused me to recognize him. He was the kid who had asked about his sister and subsequently met an unknown fate at the end of episode 23. That one episode I was watching during July 1999. When I told the administrator this, he confirmed it was the same kid. He was also featured in episode 24, an episode that only aired once at 3pm in July 1999. The police have still not found the tape. Mr. Bear then broke into song, singing about citrus fruits and how good vitamin C was for you. I could barely hear the lyrics as they were muffled by the bear mask. The kids all drink their juice, the one from episode 23 doing it rather reluctantly, and the episode ended. After viewing the tapes in possession of the Davis Road Police Station, I'm satisfied but only temporary. I still want to know the full story. The police just keep giving me the same crap about the creator of Keladon Local 21 being a fetishist pedophile, as well as an apparent cultist. I will sign off for now, get into university first, get information later. Hopefully, I will get back to this blog as soon as possible. Update. On April 17th, I finally got my G2 license. In Ontario, Canada, this allows you to drive in a car by yourself as well as some passengers after six months. I of course took advantage of this and drove into Caledon for a little Sunday drive. Since I haven't updated this blog in a while, I figured I might as well visit the house where the infamous channel of my childhood was located. The house looked different than when I last saw it in October. The place was no longer used as a daycare and just sat there, abandoned. However, it did have a for sale sign showing that someone still owned it, wanting to get rid of it though. The abandoned house drew fuzzy memories from my mind, mainly of that day my dad took me to visit Mr. Bear. A feeling of dread came upon me. What happened to the children while they were living in that house? I walked up the steps to the front door and peered through the window. Inside, I could see a nearly empty hallway with a few boxes at the end. At the end of the hallway to the right was an open doorway, presumably leading to the kitchen. To the left were two doors, both apparently leading to the rooms visible through the window outside. I wondered where the cellar entrance was located and whether it had been sealed up. I walked around to the back of the house and found my answer. Two wooden doors, lying at an almost flat angle with padlocks shut. This had to lead to the cellar. Not wanting to hang around, you cannot imagine what was going through my mind at the time. I departed. Behind the house, the empty field continued on until I reached a dense forest that lined the horizon. I wondered if that was the forest where the bodies of the children were found. I thought to myself, screw it, and proceeded to walk across the field behind the house into the forest. The forest was utterly quiet, save for a few periodic sounds of a woodpecker drilling into a distant tree. I cautiously made my way deeper into the woods not really caring about the fact that I had no idea where I was going. I don't know how to explain it, but it felt like there was something I had to find out. I came to a thinner part of the woods and a few small houses in the distance. Polo's house crossed my mind and I wondered if one of these homes had belonged to him. I neared a small clearing in which I could see three adequately sized lodges gathered around a black, charred area, showing a small fire had been lit there recently. Hey, get the hell out of our fort! Those words nearly gave me a heart attack. 
I turned to my left and saw two dark clothed people running towards me. My initial thought was to run, however, as they came closer, I saw they were really just kids in their early teens, possibly 13 or 14, maybe even 12. As they approached me, they realized my size as well. I'm 6'1", while they could have been no bigger than 5'8". One might have been 5'7". We said, get lost. The larger one, who was wearing a slipknot shirt, said half-heartedly. I stood my ground and shrugged. The shorter one, who was wearing a Metallica shirt, swung out a butterfly knife and held it in my direction. No, you wouldn't want to. I said in a deep, serious tone, trying to sound as badass as possible. I pulled out my cell phone. The two kids withdrew, the one with the Metallica shirt putting away the knife. Look dude, we don't like people in our fort so can you just go? The one in the Slipknot shirt said, obviously intimidated. I had no business in the forest anyway so I uttered out a simple, fine, and turned before I realised. I had a great opportunity. Did any of you guys hear of a guy who murdered a bunch of kids in these woods about 13 years ago? I asked the kids. The two looked at each other in confusion before the one wearing the Metallica shirt answered, Yeah, everyone knows about that guy, he said to me as if I was stupid. The kid in the Slipknot shirt continued, He still lives around here in a storm drain. My big brother's friend says he saw him in a bear costume once, wandering around the forest at night. My instincts told me this was probably a lie, and that the owner of Caledon Local is probably long gone, only existing as folklore in this smaller, isolated community. However, as a human, the thought of the mysterious unknown sparked interest within. And where is this storm drain? I asked, just out of curiosity. I don't actually believe the kid's story. The kid in the Metallica shirt stared at me for a few moments, his eyes seemingly full of annoyance, yet curiosity for me. You're not from around here, are you? Why did you even come here? Now, I do admit I was slightly startled by the nature of this question. However, I figured I might as well explain why I was there just in case people mistook my intentions. I told the two kids about my experience with the man and Caledon Local 21, and that I had to come to maybe seek out some sort of closure. Although, the kids seemed familiar with the channel as they smiled and looked at each other when I mentioned it. They also became more understanding and gave me a detailed description on how to get to the storm drain. Shortly after, I decided to turn around the way I came and head back to the house, leaving the kids at their fort. But now, you're probably wondering why I left out such detail about what the kids told me just now. It is because I'm choosing to conclude what I've gathered now. Here is what the kids told me in detail. The storm drain lies ahead of the kids' fort, the same direction I was heading. The drain ends at a small river, where access water is drained out. Near here is a small playground. The kids told me people rarely use it. The man supposedly lives in the large pipe that rainwater drains out of. People have seen him, although always either wearing a bear mask or the mask and a full body bear costume. Note, I do not believe this is true and in fact it's simply a myth made by the residents of Caledon. The story does not seem plausible in any way. Why did no one call the police? Why didn't this guy look suspicious and other questions like that leave the story invalid? I may visit the storm drain, not because I believe the story, but, but because I want an excuse to visit Caledon again, so this blog doesn't die. With no more tapes to watch, I don't know what to talk about anymore. Thanks for continuing to support me and my blog. I know many are looking forward to more information about what happened in Caledon during the year 1999, and I'll do my best to continue my research into the topic. Elliot out. Update. Wow, 
Nearly five months since I last updated. I'm guessing everyone pretty much thought I was dead, right? Thankfully, I'm not, but in all seriousness, I really have been busy these past few months. And a blog about something that could have killed me as a kid is a little low on my current priorities list. As of now, I'm living in Waterloo, Ontario, attending the University of Waterloo for computer engineering. Yeah, I'm a keener. As you can imagine, engineering is no walk in the park, so obviously I nearly forgot about this blog. But as you can see now, I'm back. I remembered to visit the storm drain the kids from Caledon Forest told me about. It was out in a clearing between the wooded area nearby a marsh. Unfortunately, I found absolutely nothing, save for a turtle that retreated into its built-in home when it saw me. I snapped some pics of the pipe, which I have posted as well. Also, let me tell you, it was not a storm drain like they said it was. What I saw was a simple pipe, possibly to channel the excess water from the marsh. When I returned to Caledon, however, I simply kept putting off uploading everything until I forgot all about my blog. It just didn't seem important anymore. Please forgive me. It wasn't until only recently that I'm now interested in my case again. On September 10th, I received an email from this email address, returnthebee the bee at hotmail.com. Funny, am I right? Well, it gets better. I'm going to copy and paste the exact email the guy sent me. Dear Elliot, my dear, dear boy, I have missed you ever so much. Oh, how you've grown. Your twinkling eyes have stayed the same, however. Those eyes looking for adventure. Oh, how imagining them brings warmth to my old bare heart. That day you came to visit me, I felt so happy. I wanted to go out and pick strawberries. He told me you would come looking. Oh yes, he told me you would come looking. Now, it will be soon. You won't be so lonely soon. I am ever so sorry I couldn't say hello to you when you came to visit. Not once, two times. Do not threat, however. You will soon finally get to play with the other children. I will try making my cellar even more cozier than before. 100 fuzzy hugs, Mr. Bear. Now obviously this letter is fake, but still, I would like to thank whoever sent it. Just reading this letter creeped me out. But because of it, I am now full of this new interest to continue my blog. I guess it's just funny trying to pursue the mysteries I've always questioned. Now, my roommate knows about all this. He thought the letter was real. He actually seemed more scared than I was for a second, but then I shrugged it off. So he did too. I mean, what are the chances of this being real? How would Mr. Bear know when I went to Caledon on those occasions? more or less know my email, or me still being interested in his cellar. <laughs> I'm going to send a reply to return the bee. Wow, just look at the email address. You can tell someone wanted to freak me out. It didn't really work though, although to whoever you are, thank you for sparking my interest back into the full matter. Maybe I can find out more about what happened to Mr. Bear. Hopefully because, although I don't buy that email, a part of me still feels anxious. Thank you to all those who are still following me and have become avid fans. You are also why I'm choosing to do this. Thanks guys. Update. Wow, I can't believe this blog hasn't been deleted yet. I haven't posted anything for so long. I have my reasons and I'd rather not discuss them just yet. It's been a rather traumatic year for me. Some of you were right, I shouldn't have gone back to trying to relive the mysteries of my childhood, but I couldn't resist. It's been over a year since my last post and a lot has happened. Let's recap where I am right now with regards to the whole Mr. Bear incident. Return the bee at hotmail.com is no longer in use. I tried replying to the email but I got no reply. I tried again back in March, still no response. I actually moved up to Ottawa, 
the capital of Canada for those who don't know, for university, so I haven't been back to Caledon or back home in the Peel region for a while. I had my reasons for leaving as you could guess why. I've had to make a new email account because people keep prank emailing me pretending to be Mr. Bear. Thanks a lot guys. Why have I ventured back into this blog? Mitchell Wilson, remember my dad takes cup friend, gave me a phone call on October 23rd about a tape that was found in a branch of the Brampton Public Library. Brampton is my hometown in case you haven't picked up on that. He claimed he isn't allowed to discuss the contents of the tape with me as it is still in evidence but he still asked me to come check it out when I return home. That tape got the gears grinding again because we all know what was the last tapes I saw. I can only imagine what can be on it. I'm guessing it must have something to do with Caledon Local 21. I guess I just wanted to say I'm continuing this blog and thank you for everyone who still follows it. I don't know when my next entry will be but when I see that tape I'll write what I find. I don't know what to expect but the idea of seeing another tape has gotten me interested in the whole mystery all over again. Elliot Update. It's been a long year for me. University has been giving me the usual sleepless nights, especially since I transferred to Ottawa, which is THE place to party. Sarcasm. But now, I'm back home with my dad in Brampton, the town I grew up in. I got home on the 18th of December and have been visiting my friends and family, or at least that's what I would rather have done. Now that festive holiday cheer that I usually have this time of a month is absent. To answer the hundreds of emails and comments I got, yes, I did see the tapes that my dad's friend Mitchell Wilson promised to show me. These tapes, however, act as a curse. I want to know more. Yet I want to forget everything. I, I couldn't help it. I needed to see those tapes. Not only for myself, but for all you guys who are just as intrigued as I am by that ominous man in a bear suit from my past. However, after viewing those tapes, I feel that pit of dread deep inside me once again. That feeling where I know that all those kids in those videos are dead. That I I could have been one of those kids, and that humanity is a dark, dark place. If you haven't skipped this paragraph for the juicier details below, thank you for listening to my ramblings. On Wednesday, January 1st, I called Mitchell Wilson and asked if there was time where I could come by and view the tapes. Things were pretty slow at the station because of a snowstorm, so... He said I could come down any time that day. The tapes were located at a branch not too far from me, so I braved the slushy roads and terrible Brampton drivers and made my way to the Peel Regional Police Station, located at the Bramalea City Centre. I met Wilson at the front desk where he then led me up the second floor and into a small office. He instructed me to have a seat and, and wait while he went and got the tapes. Before leaving the office, he turned to me and said, I know you're curious, but are you sure you want to do this? Of course I did, or at least thought so. Besides, Wilson's friend had pulled a lot of strings to get me in there and I didn't want to waste the opportunity. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 30 Mr. Bear never ceases to disturb me especially after what almost happened when I was younger. This episode took place outside in a forest at dusk, making it slightly hard to see, especially considering the quality of the film, a trademark of anything from Caledon Local 21. The episode started with a camera being held in the paws of Mr. Bear, aiming it at himself. That bear mask. It looked more sinister in the shadows of the trees. The unmistakable muffled voice spoke up. Hello children, today I will be doing a wonderful thing for my friends. I will be delivering them to a faraway land, where 
They will surely be happy. Mr. Bear then turned to the camera around to show an ATV with an attached trailer. But what stood out the most was that the trailer contained seven motionless children lying side by side. The, this is the first load, but more will be on their way soon. Mr. Bear turned around and pointed the camera at a large burlap tarp spread on the ground. He picked the tarp up, revealing a large hole that must have been 12 feet deep and maybe about 15 feet wide. The rest of the episode consisted of Mr. Bear taking each kid and dropping them into the hole. I asked Wilson if they were dead, to which he shook his head and replied, Not yet. Soon, all the kids were in the pit. Some were in awkward positions due to them being tossed in, but they remained unconscious. The vitamin C will surely help these children on the great journey that awaits them. Mr. Bear mentioned as he panned the camera towards multiple bottles of gasoline besides a brush. The cameraman zoomed into the bottles as Mr. Bear hummed before the episode ended. Wilson revealed to me that these were seven of the 16 victims found burnt to a crisp. The gasoline is what the man playing Mr. Bear used to light them on fire. A pit full of burning children. Who the hell would do that? That feeling of dread found me once again when I realized that I could have been one of those kids. Wilson then explained to me that he had previously lied and felt that I wouldn't be able to handle the disturbing and graphic nature of the episode. And you know what? Maybe I can't. I don't even want to see it. I'm satisfied for now. But I just need some time to get myself together. The thing is, the man who ran Caledon Local 21 is still out there. More to come soon. Elliot. <laughs>